Good morning and welcome to worship. Welcome to Woodside. I'm Deb Conrad, pastor of Woodside. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm very happy to join with you again this morning after a little bit of time away. It's good to, it's good to worship together, to be together in such a strange time um, to remind ourselves that we have community, that we are community. If you're new with us today, we especially want to be community for you. We use the, all of us use the comment section to let one another know we're here, to exchange greetings, to lift up prayer concerns. So please feel free to be active in the comment section today. Um, if you have prayer concerns, you can, you can put them in the comments and we will all be aware and lift them up, although they will not be in our, in our recorded um, prayer out loud prayers this morning but if you would like someone on that list just let me know or put that in the comments and we will make sure that that person is on our prayer list as well a little later we will be sharing a holy communion meal so you'll want to have bread and beverage ready if you would like to participate this is god's sacred gift to us to bind us as community and remind us that we are that we are accompanied by a powerful spirit so if you'd like to participate have those things ready that will come at the end of worship Today, in the, in the wake of heinous things in our nation, we are observing Epiphany, the, uh, the festival of the, the sages, the wise men from the East who came and, and found, followed the star and found the baby Jesus. Um, this, is not <coughs> this is not exactly Epiphany because Epiphany is a fixed day. It falls on January the 6th, and we know what was happening here on January 6th. Um, so it's the 13th day, the 12, after the 12 days of Christmas. The calendar's tricky, and so we rarely get to celebrate this on a Sunday. So we took a little bit of a liberty with the liturgical calendar, and we shifted this festival of light and hope and vision. So today, in a bit of defiance, we are pretending it is January 6th. We are celebrating um, the Epiphany, which January 6th, no doubt, being a day we would very much like to do over in America. Um, we can't do that, but we can celebrate Epiphany. So thank you for being here. Um, thank you for choosing this as your place of worship today. We say every week, and we mean it, whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome at Woodside Church. Let's join in our call to worship. Magi, sages, astrologers, people who see things, people who see visions, people with vision, people with gifts to bring, people willing to follow a star. Perhaps this is who we are. Perhaps this is who we are willing to be. We worship in anticipation that it could happen to us. Let's pray. God of visions and dreams, draw close to us and draw us close to you that we might see something we did not see before. Receive our worship, bless our community. Amen.
My name is Lara Eufinger, and this is a reading by Jan Richardson. For those who have far to travel, a blessing for Epiphany. If you could see the journey whole, you might never undertake it, might never dare the first step that propels you from the place you have known toward the place you know not. Call it one of the mercies of the road, that we see it only by stages, as it opens before us, as it comes into our keeping, step by single step. There is nothing for it but to go, and by our going, take the vows the pilgrim takes, to be faithful to the next step, to rely on more than the map, to heed the signposts of intuition and dream, to follow the star that only you will recognize, to keep an open eye for the wonders that attend the path, to press on beyond distractions, beyond fatigue, beyond what would tempt you from the way. There are vows that only you will know, the secret promises of your particular path, and the new ones you will need to make when the road is revealed by turns you could not have foreseen. Keep them, break them, make them again. Each promise becomes part of the path, each choice creates the road that will take you to the place where at last you will kneel to offer the gift most needed, the gift that only you can give before turning to go home by another way. Hi, my name is Dale Emring, and this is the reading from Matthew 2. After Jesus' birth, which happened in Bethlehem of Judea, during the reign of Herod, astrologers from the east arrived in Jerusalem and asked, Where is the newborn ruler of the Jews? We observed his star at its rising and have come to pay homage. At this news, Herod became greatly disturbed, as well as did all Jerusalem. Summoning all the chief priests and religious scholars of the people, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they informed him, here is what the prophet has written. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, since from you will come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Herod called the astrologers aside and found out from them the exact time of the star's appearance. And then he sent them to Bethlehem after having instructed them, Go and get detailed information about the child. When you have found him, report back to me, so that I may go and offer homage too. After their audience with the ruler, they set out. The star with the, which they had observed at the rising went ahead of them until it came to a standstill over the place where the child lay. They were overjoyed at seeing the star, and upon entering the house found the child with Mary his mother. They prostrated themselves and paid homage. Then they opened their coffers and presented the child with gifts of gold, frankincense, and mirror. They were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, 
so they went back to their own country by another route. After the astrologers had left, the angel of God suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph with the command, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you otherwise. Herod is searching for the child to destroy him. Joseph got up, awakened Jesus and Mary, and they left that night for Egypt. They stayed there until the death of Herod to fulfill what God had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my own. Herod became furious when he realized that the astrologers had outwitted him. He gave orders to kill all male children that were two years old and younger living in and around Bethlehem. The age of the children was based on the date Herod had learned from the astrologers. Then what was spoken through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, sobbing and lamenting loudly. It was Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled. For they were no more. After Herod's death, the angel of God appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt with the command, Get up, take the child and his mother, and set out for the land of Israel. Those who have designs on the life of the child are dead. Joseph got up, awakened Jesus and Mary, and they returned to the land of Israel. Joseph heard, however, that Archelaus had succeeded Herod as ruler of Judea. And Joseph was afraid to go back there. Instead, because of a warning received by Joseph in a dream, the family went to the region of Galilee. There, they settled in a town called Nazareth. This has been some kind of week. Never saw that coming, some may say, while others more honestly acknowledge that it has been inevitable for five years. This president incited an insurrection which left five people dead, our Capitol building in a shambles, and our democracy clinging to life by a thread who did not see that coming. For those who haven't followed the news, terrorists invaded the U.S. Capitol building on Wednesday, sending our election officials and their staff into hiding in fear for their lives. For hours, these white nationalists occupied looting and vandalizing, calling for the execution of Vice President Pence by hanging from a gallows someone had conveniently constructed on site, taking selfies with the cops who were supposed to guard the place, cops who have in other cases arrested protesters for things like praying, playing guitar, attempting to enter a closed building, sitting on the floor outside a Senate office. All the while, President Nero and his offspring and hangers-on hid out in a tent on the White House lawn, watching it unfold on big screen TV, drinking champagne and dancing to Gloria by Laura Branigan. You remember that song, Gloria? It was, it was in the soundtrack for Flashdance, featured in The Wolf of Wall Street, and even showed up in the assassination of Johnny Versace, American Crime Story. So, if you want to throw a party celebrating obscene excess, criminality, and a meteoric rise to power so grand you quit answering your phone, this is your song. Some of its lines, perhaps particularly appropriate for our failed despot, include, you're always on the run now. I think you're heading for a breakdown. All the voices in your head are calling. And my personal favorite, you don't have to answer, leave them hanging on the line. Which is precisely how the Secretary of Defense responded when the House Majority Leader and the Governor of Maryland called multiple times trying to get authorization for Maryland to send its state riot police and National Guard troops. 90 minutes, hanging on the line, waiting for a callback while all the Trumps partied and soaked it all in. We know this because Don Jr. posted video. You can watch it for yourself on YouTube. The president, as we have noted many times before, is a narcissistic, paranoid, insecure autocrat who cannot abide anything that smacks of competition. He wants all the power, all the glory, all the adoration for himself. Which, of course, brings us to our scripture reading for this morning, with its key antagonist, King Herod, a paranoid, narcissistic, insecure autocrat who, according to the story, the story about, about visitors looking for the relatively newborn Jesus, 
sees only competition and commits to a deadly plan, the murder of every male baby under two years old, a massacre we commemorate each December 28th, which we call the Holy Innocence. We may not want to think that Trump would go as far as Herod said, was said to, to preserve his power and adoration of his delusional cult, but I think we are naive if we don't at least acknowledge the possibility. The more things change, you know. Judea was part of the Roman Empire, conquered by Rome, which under Caesar Augustus was enjoying the age of Pax Romana, world peace, enforced, of course, by military, economic, and spiritual requirements of this Caesar and his surrogate in the region, Herod the Great. Judea was occupied by Rome's military, administered by Rome's economy, governed by Rome's minions, including Herod, Herod the Great, he would want me to say that, who was himself Jewish and resented by his Jewish subjects because he lived off the largesse of their occupiers, lording it over them mercilessly. He did some good stuff, apparently, but when you're occupied, exploited, and oppressed, the bright side is harder to see. The great one, Herod, was also himself subordinate to Augustus, which he probably hated, sort of like someone we know hates to imagine he is subordinate to courts and laws and whatnot. Whether he might historically actually have ordered the babies killed, at least one Bible scholar says, hmm, maybe. Dr. Paul Mayer, retired professor of ancient history at Western Michigan, described Herod's paranoia this way in a podcast. Herod actually put to death three of his own sons on suspicion of treason. He put to death his favorite wife of 10, then he killed one of his many mothers-in-law, he invited the high priest down to Jericho for a swim. They played a very rough game of water polo, and then he drowned him. He killed several uncles and a couple of cousins. And I think the Trump children should be making a few notes here. He was worried that nobody would mourn his death, Dr. Mayer goes on. The people were, in fact, planning a general celebration when it looked like his end was imminent. And nobody likes to, know, likes to die knowing they're going to dance on your grave. So he was going to give the people something to cry about, said Mayer, which I wonder might cause us all to worry just a little. Mayer goes on, Herod tells his sister to arrest all the Jewish leaders in the land and imprison them in the Hippodrome just below the palace. He wants these leaders all executed in that Hippodrome, so there will be thousands of households weeping on that day at the time that he, Herod the Great, dies. Mayer concludes, so is that the kind of sweet guy who could have killed the babies in Bethlehem? Yeah, I think so, he says. And then he notes that we're probably only talking about five or six kids in a town as small as Bethlehem, which might be why it never made the news. And I believe that pales in comparison to 5,400 children separated from their parents at our southern border, nearly 550 of them whose parents still cannot be found. Of course, the story from Matthew's Gospel is not history, we know that. It is theology. John Spong, the famous Episcopal bishop and heretic, and Borg and Crossan, among our favorite Woodside um, scholars, declare there was no literal star in the East, no literal wise men, no visitors who accidentally run afoul of Herod. Spong goes so far as to suggest that Mary and Joseph were in fact invented parents because Jesus became famous and some people decades later began telling stories. They needed to fill in some gaps. I'm okay with that. I don't care much at all actually because who Jesus' parents were is not a faith thing for me. He had parents, he got born, and his life became an insult to the people in charge because he claimed and proclaimed the program of Exodus and the vision of the prophets that all people should have what they need, that the way of empire, the way empire does business, is no way to do business. <coughs> but with all due respect to scripture, none of that gives us a definitive place to begin a definitive plan for how we get out of the mess that we're in here and now. So what does this story matter to us? The story I'm learning is not really supposed to tell us much about Jesus' birth. It is supposed to prepare us for his death, which we will observe all too soon on April 2nd. 
The story was written decades after Jesus was killed and a whole lot of stuff was projected backward to make the case going forward. Jesus was Herod Antipas' rival at his death, just as he was Herod the Great' rival at his birth. Jesus was born to be king. There can only be one king, and it's Jesus, says scripture. In Luke's gospel, the rival at his birth is Augustus, the emperor. There's no level of royalty or elected authority, apparently, for whom Jesus is not a threat. Jesus takes on empire. But what can we do with it? What is it to us? Especially in the days of revolution and insurrection and democracy on life support, what do we make of our empire in the context of this story of Jesus? Maybe the broad message is that there will be narcissistic, paranoid tyrants in every age. Maybe the broad story is that if we do Jesus right, he continues to be a threat to empire. But today I want to ponder the sages that got, the, the star that guided the sages, even if it wasn't a real star, and even if they weren't real sages. There's a light in the world. There is a light in the world. Augustus, and through him Herod, proclaimed peace through victory. Violence was the answer. Suppression, repression, oppression, whatever it took to keep control. We can have that kind of world. We, we have that kind of world. But there's a light. There is a light. Among the many hours of news I have devoured these last few days, Joy Reid, a black anchorwoman of MSNBC, asked this question. What has America lost this week? I don't know how she answered it because I started jotting my own notes. My own answers included delusions of grandeur, our national myth that we are special, that we are exceptional. We are not. We are in trouble. Fascism does not slink away the first time it fails. It doubles down. It looks for new openings, new barricades to breach. I'm not talking about the terrorists who raided the Capitol. I'm talking about the political party that opens the doors for them and stoked their resentments, called them to order and, and armed them to the teeth. The party that raided our common life and will again. We saw its poster boys in full campaign mode already, Ted Cruz and, J and Josh Harley, hoping, uh, Hawley hoping to claim the mantle of Trump as if that mantle still has power. We saw its facilitators, Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell and others, back away from a full-blown denunciation of the siege, equivocating just enough to signal support for the almost end of democracy. Phew, that was close, they seemed to be saying to themselves as they shrug off efforts to remove this dangerous man as they regroup for what comes next. After the astrologers had left, the story says, the angel of God suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph with this command, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. So Joseph did. And if any of us are thinking of packing a bag to be ready to run, I wouldn't argue or second guess or judge. Passport, cash, valuables, medications, change of undies, who could blame us? These are dangerous times. Not unlike the times of Hitler, the Third Reich that began slowly, took root over time, and fed itself on the frustration of unemployed people, coaxed them to blame foreigners and folks not like us, and encouraged violence in the streets to show who is boss. This is Hitler's playbook. Let's not be fooled. This is not over. And of course, it's Saturday when I'm recording this, a full 24 hours before you will hear it, and 24 hours, a lot can happen in this administration's chaos. And Inauguration Day is still 11 days away, which surely will not be peaceful because they are already calling for protests. But there's light. There is a light. There is a star in the metaphorical night sky that guides our way and gives us hope. We can flee from the darkness, as so many have done in the face of despotic regime, regimes, or we can walk purposefully into the light of what is possible. What we cannot do is stand by and pretend it is not happening, that it cannot happen, that it has nothing to do with us. This week as events were unfolding, I called Karen Eaton. Karen, Kathy, and I, and a few others have made a weekly habit of an hour on the courthouse lawn with our signs calling for racial justice. 
I worried that the chaos in Washington would bleed over to Flint, that folks who wanted to attack the Capitol but couldn't afford the trip might decide to attack the halls of Genesee County government instead. I asked Karen what she thought, and I said I would understand if she wanted to skip a week. I was secretly hoping that I might like to skip a week, hunker down in safety. Karen said she thought it was really important for us to be there, and she was going. So I did too, and, and Kathy did too. Wednesday night, Thursday morning, in the, in the wee hours, an activist interviewed on MSNBC, a black woman, said her position is that we have to let them know that we are not going to be intimidated. So we became a little bit of light on the courthouse lawn on Thursday, just for an hour, just on Thursday. But it was an hour. People honked their horns and waved. Nobody shouted, all lives matter. We were shining a light just for an hour. There's light in the world. Stacey Abrams worked 10 years to get two Democratic senators elected in Georgia this week. 10 years, not because Democrats are saviors, you understand, but because we need a platform that acknowledges that there's a common good to which we must, must reach, and we need a Democratic Senate to stop what the Republicans are doing. Now it will be our work to make that Senate work for all of us, to make the House work for all of us, to push our oh-so-reluctant president-elect to see that health care and guaranteed basic income and fair housing and racial justice and a different approach to policing or an end to policing and in favor of something more relational and tax policy that eliminates billion-dollar hoarding. All of these things are not evils to be deplored, not radical acts to be avoided, but sources of well-being to be funded and celebrated. Even Augustus and Herod had good roads. We can do this. There's a light in the world. Stacey Abrams shined a light. You have other stories. You know where the light is. Light is Courtney calling out fraudulent Christianity on Facebook so often that she gets suspended for weeks at a time. Light is Eileen sending me a message of hope. Hope, it says, is what keeps us drenched and dredging through this darkness for one more day. Light is Jay get, letting us give out his cell phone number to anyone who's going through a financial challenge so he can try to do something to make it better. Light is you disrupting racism in your circles, in your families. And light is us checking one another as we commit to, to growing and learning together. Light is our worship team tending to one another with grace and tenderness and insisting that worship reflect our times and speak truth to our circumstances. Light is folks who show up, who share what they have and, and work to keep us up and running, who invite folks to see something else, who believe there is a better way. Light is church insisting that how we do faith and how we do politics are not unrelated to one another, but ways of living the Jesus life right here, embracing the reign of God right here. Light is a meal we will share together, the meal of Jesus. Do this, he said, and remember, no, there is light. Times feel desperate. I get that. And I may or may not be packing my own go bag before it's over. Lawrence Toms echoed the desperation in his poem, Call the Wise Men, which I stumbled upon a couple weeks ago. He wrote this, Awake the Magi and call them three to the next business of the day, because the star that once rose in the east is now falling from the precarious heavens. And if ever there was a gift more needed, we need wise men on broken horses to get here now and sooner to smack the infant's cheeks and please, for the love of God, just get him breathing. Just get him breathing. O come, O come, Emmanuel, we sang through Advent and Christmas. It is our song of pleading and remembering. We are people of light, people of promise. Arise, shine, for your light has come, said Isaiah. In a reading we also assign to Epiphany. The glory of God is rising upon you. Though darkness still covers the earth and dense clouds enshroud the people, upon you God now dawns. The star might be falling from the heavens or all the stars, or the heavens themselves may be falling all around us. But there is light. A child is breathing, and we are breathing, and there is light. There is light. Amen.
Good morning. My name is Linda Angus. Would you please join me in today's prayer? The events of the past year and of this past week weigh heavily upon us. In these troubling times, we call on God to receive our prayers, saying, O oh God, lead us out of the darkness and into your light, that our wounded and numb hearts may be given hope and that we may be empowered by God's guiding hand, we pray, O oh God, lead us out of the darkness and into your light. That our nation acknowledges injustice and oppression in all of its forms and calls for justice now, we pray, O oh God, lead us out of the darkness and into your light. That we may be instrumental in alleviating the pains of oppression by reaching out to the poor, the homeless, and the neglected and by shedding whatever privilege we bear to allow the lives of others to shape us and make us better neighbors. We pray, O oh God, lead us out of the darkness and into your light. That we learn to honor and respect the natural resources of the planet and bring an end to consumerism that encourages waste. We pray, O oh God, lead us out of the darkness and into your light that our beloved community may be steadfast in prayer and strong in love and reach out to provide a safe haven for others. We pray, O oh God, lead us out of the darkness and into your light. That all in any need, those we know and those whose need is known only to God, may find in us storehouses of grace and care and be tended on the way. We pray, O oh God, lead us out of the darkness and into your light. O oh God, we give thanks for the birth of your vision and the person of Jesus and its rebirth in us. Send your light to guide us. Empower us to follow where it leads. Amen. Good morning, I'm Kathy Eaton. In these weeks between Epiphany and Ash Wednesday, we are mindful of the pain in our world and we search for glimmers of hope, still trying to make a difference, trying to be courageous and active in the midst of events we cannot control or completely understand. We gather at Woodside for hope and camaraderie, holding each other close and embracing a vision of something else. We insist that we will be the light in these times. Your offerings help us do that. By your gifts, we offer worship, study groups, acts of care, and outreach. We welcome newcomers and find every possible way to keep us all informed. Offering is an act of hope, of thanksgiving, of defiance, and of worship. If you are able to share a gift, please use the link on our website, woodsidechurch.net. Thank you. And now we have come to the time of a holy meal. Sages from the East follow, followed a light to find hope and redemption. Joseph packed a go bag and hustled his young family out of Bethlehem into hiding as refugees. But before all that, way back in the stories of Exodus, when Israel was in slavery to Egypt, when Passover became a thing, the people were frightened and longing for escape. 
They had their go bags, their entire lives, packed and ready for a quick departure whenever it might come. They made bread for the journey, but they knew they could not wait for it to rise, so they left out the yeast and satisfied themselves with flat and hard bread, bread of oppression, bread of urgency. When Jesus gathered with his friends, the story of the Exodus was on their minds. Some say it was Passover and they were celebrating. Jesus told them the night was about to be ugly, reminded them to look for the light. They shared a dinner that only he knew was their final meal. And to help it stick with them, to help them remember and stay on the path, he gave them a ritual. He took a piece of bread and he broke it and blessed it and he gave it to them to share. He said, this bread is me with you. Eat it and know that I am with you. Then he poured a cup of wine He blessed it and gave it to them to share. This wine is me with you, he said. Drink and know that I am with you. And here we are, wondering what life will be, pondering escape perhaps, considering our options. When the people escaped from Egypt, God led them through the wilderness by a, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, says the ancient story. There was light to guide their way. There was light for shepherds in Bethlehem on Christmas night, says Luke. There was light for travelers from the east on Epiphany, says Matthew. There will be light to guide our way, says Isaiah. Eat and drink and count on the light. Let's pray. God of the day, God of the night, we count on you to guide our feet, to show us what is needed, to make us strong for the work, for the journey. Pour out your spirit on this food and drink that it may be for us your tangible promise. Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. This meal is ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Let's eat. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that you have gifted us with food and shown us a way. Nourish us in this meal and let us be your people, your light. Teach us to live. Teach us to love. Amen. Thank you again for choosing Woodside today. It is so good to gather. If you are inclined to share a cup of coffee, Coffee, please join our Zoom fellowship immediately following worship. There's a link in the comments, I hope, or on our website calendar, surely. I would love to see your faces in this very odd time. This week, there are some opportunities for righteous engagement. There are two, bo two book groups, both starting new books right about now, and you're welcome to join either one. So just let us know and we'll get you a book. There's a Sunday morning book, uh, group at 9.30 before worship reading Mediocre, something about the dangerous legacy of white male America. And on Thursday evenings at seven, we're reading, we're just beginning this week, Marcus Borg's book, Jesus, Uncovering the Life Teachings and Relevance of a Religious Revolutionary. And you're, you're welcome in either of those groups or both if you'd like to do that. Thursdays at one o'clock, Thursday at one o'clock, we will be on the courthouse lawn again just for an hour. So if you are inclined, uh, bring a sign and a chair and join us. Um, I have been asked to create a resource for calling on our elected officials, so you can watch for an announcement of that. I'm going to work this week on getting something on our website, numbers and email addresses, and a template for expressing your opinion. Please never hesitate to let our leaders know what you think. They need to hear from thoughtful and caring people. If you'd like to be part of what our social action team is doing, and there's always something, talk to Jay Cummings or to Carla Pirick or me. There's, there's always uh, an interesting thing on their agenda to get involved with. And, and finally this, our worship team meets every Tuesday evening to plan the, the weeks that we, we pull together this thing, and it kind of always is a minor miracle that it happens, but this team works very hard. So if you think this might be your thing, if you'd like to be part of our worship planning, 
then you are invited to join us. You are not required to be a member of Woodside, just a worshiper who cares and has um, uh, something to offer to this team. So thank you. I would love to talk with you about that if you're interested. If you would like to be a reader in worship, then you can let me know that or Karen Eaton. Uh, again, you don't have to be on the team. You don't have to be a member. And, and we try to make it as easy as possible to deal with the technology of the thing. We just like seeing lots of faces in worship. So please, please be invited. And now let's join in our benediction. God bless us and keep us. God's face shine on us and be gracious to us. God look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. Amen.